If you add together the story of winning the Diageo World Class Competition in Canada, then of launching one successful company, and finally of becoming the first Diageo World Class Global Cocktailian, you've just combined a few of the many ingredients that make up our guests today. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by everyone in this industry. Before Lauren Mote had become the Diageo Reserve and world-class global cocktailian and co-founder of Bittered Sling, she asked herself this question, how do I blend food and a real job together? The path to that answer led her straight into the world of culinary creation. Over the next two episodes, we'll follow her journey to discover how her cherished experiences encouraged her to succeed. Before we begin, please take the time to donate to some of your favorite bars or have cocktails delivered right to your door. You can find ways to help on the homepage of my website, alushlifemanual.com. Now, let's meet Lauren. I am so excited to have you on my show. So thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> you, I read somewhere where you said, I'm just going to look at my notes here, that you are, that you wanted your bitters to help to define the future of bitters or the future of something. And I feel that you really have helped define the future of what it is to work in this industry in, in this, this modern time. And so that makes me thrilled to have you here on the other end of uh, the internet. So thank you so much for joining me. And I would love to know a little bit about the winding way that you arrived at this point. And um, I usually start with where people grew up because I'm really interested in the, you know, the, the I guess the milieu in which you were created as a person. So why don't we start there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a long story, but I suppose this is why, uh, you know, sessions like this last as long as they do, because there's just so much content when you say, tell us your life story. It's like, how much time do you have? Um, but uh, it's, it, Susan, it's a great pleasure to, to be with you today. And I appreciate the very much that uh, I guess you were following along on that uh, Cocktail Kitchen Instagram live that I did with Booze Brain. So uh, it's it's great um, to to connect. So my beginning, my goodness. Well, I'm, I'm originally from downtown Toronto in Canada, and uh, I used to spend my childhood with my two brothers and my mom and dad, and we would be walking up and down Young Street, popping into what we'd call jobbers, you know, little, there were the, the one and $2 stores before they were called one and $2 stores, and uh, comic book shops. We used to my, my parents were both in film and television, as well okay. as uh, my mother in the 70s was a, a runway model. And before she was trying to figure out what she was doing, she was stoic and beautifully tall and uh, European. And so for her, she was very excited about figuring out what her next step was while she was modeling. And my dad uh, was also uh, a producer and actor. And so we were born into this strangely pop culture slash film and TV family where my brothers and I, we ended up growing up in the arts and the arts to some families might be fine arts, might be acting, might be something else. But in our family, it was a combination of writing, of programming, of food, of flavor, of, you know, travel. But it was, you know, it was also a, a really tough childhood because we, we were very poor in Toronto and uh, we, you know, my, my mom really kept that from us when we were growing up. So we had to, we had to learn how to really cherish the, the individual things that, that we would have, whether it was that special comic book that we found or that, you know, that perfect moment, that perfect book or the perfect relationship with a friend. Um, that was really like the focal point of how I grew up. And as I continued, um, to go through this journey of life, I, I think those things were the very tactile characteristics that I kept in every, every moment and every relationship that I would develop over the years. And granted, I'm, that's when I was zero, you know, when right. it, in 1982, when it all began um, on the Queen's birthday, no less April 21st, 1982 is my birthday. And, um, 
you know, I'm 38 today. I just celebrated my birthday a week and a half ago. And I, happy birthday. Oh, thanks. Thanks again. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a really interesting one to, you know, as you get older to, to have moments of pause, to not necessarily hope for, you know, this is what I want for the coming year, but more retrospective and thinking what we have done in the past and really being happy with the journey that you've had so far and sort of making sense of each of those moments and what they could mean for the future, I think is a better way of, you know, looking at things and saying, and for the next year, I hope to do something finally better that I can be proud of. It's, you know, we have to be proud of those, those smaller moments. So in, in growing up, whether it was, you know, public school or high school, I was heavy into athletics and, and still am um, always. How about, how about performing since you came oh. from an acting background? Was that part of it as well? Yeah. And well, performing in, in sports scenario and was yeah. all, was also the same in drama scenario. So I think in, in every aspect of my, of my journey um, academically when I was growing up in school was uh, being part of a team and being champion for your ability to perform, you know, talent X. Um, I, I used to write short stories, used to create skits. Um, I used to star in some things as well as be very happy to be a supporting player. Um, in, uh, in sports, I was, I was the sweeper in soccer. I played soccer for almost 20 years and would run up and down the field and take the big kicks. Like it was like, I became like the, the center of attention just in those moments. And that was, that was enough for me. Um, yeah. And you know, the, I, I think the performance background has, has really helped in terms of, uh, I suppose, looking now at going after what you want if you have the ability to create that really critical confidence and self-esteem in order to feel like you're enough and feel like what you can contribute is impactful and worth something. I mean, you stick that in the hands of, uh, of somebody that is, is, has the understanding of how to be a performer and the whole fake it till you make it thing. I mean, it all kind of comes part and parcel of the same concept. And also a competitor. So performing comp competition, you know, all of that. Definitely. Yeah. Mixed yeah. in. I, you know what? I, I loved winning as, as much as the next person, but it wasn't the reason why I competed and it wasn't the reason why I performed. I think it was more getting excited that you could have an audience. You could have an audience of people that were sort of watching your every move and really interested in, in the story that you would share or what you had to say. And I, I still say that to, to young bartenders and people in our profession now that it, it will take years, decades to build an audience. And once you have it and you're on the center stage, like, what do you have to say? So I think it was cultivating that. Also, I guess, proving to yourself that you can do it. That's what I mean by competition really mm -hmm. as well. You know, yes, I'm going to try this and not shy away from it. I may fail, but there is the hope that I can achieve it. And let me, I enjoy the, you know, that test. And I yeah. guess, you know, yeah. obviously winning uh, for Canada, the world class, Diageo world class, you know, that's the competitor in you. you. You did do these competitions and you were able to achieve so much because I guess of that, you know, that spirit as well. Yeah. And I, and, and I think sort of later, later in my career when, when, you know, fast forwarding to, to say 2010 uh, to 2015, you know, I, at that point, I'd been bartending since, you know, 1999 or 2000. So, I mean, I was already in, um, you know, well within the first half, even the second half of my career. And I, I felt that, you know, in that time that people would compete for one of two reasons. You would compete to prove something to other people, or you would compete to prove something to yourself. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy <laughs> competing to prove something to myself. It I think it's very important that, um, you know, that you, we were just talking about this before we started, that it's important to, to have that uh, recognition, I think, you know, not just for some people, but for all people. People need to know that what they're contributing is enough and that they're uh, part of something special. And it gives almost the cause to keep going. But when you're competing with yourself, it's like this really crazy thing that happens inside. It, it's almost the jolt of energy. It's the fuel, the spark. And, and everybody sees it. And, and mm -hmm. so, you know, for me, when I competed in cocktail competitions, it wasn't necessarily because I had to win. Of course, I'm in it to, to try and win it. But 
I tried to see what the other positive outcomes would be just by being part of it. And being part of it gets your story out, gets your name out. It gets you more opportunities than you would have had sitting on the sidelines and, and helping someone else go through it. I think you can you can pay it forward in the future to somebody else and, and be the shoulders for them to stand on. But you have to create that platform first. And you can't do that without the courage and without the opportunity. Of course, of course. Now, let's just go back a little because I skipped ahead a little um, <laughs> about maybe your first um, experience with food and how you started, you know, I know that, you, that you've studied other things, but um, how, how food came into your life. Well, I, I did mention very briefly, because I don't like to dwell on it so much, but we did, we did grow up in, in, a, in a very, very poor family. And it was uh, only revealed to me when I turned 18, when I was with my mom going through some, some of her poetry and things that she had written as sort of her, uh, her um, self-help, I guess, for her, just writing things down that were going on. Um, my parents split when I was really young as well, so that was very challenging. But um, she only revealed to me when I was 18 that she used to go to the food bank to, to get us non-perishable food. And she somehow kept that from my brothers and I. And so we had meals prepared by, um, by our grandparents and some things dropped off here and there, but we were none the wiser. So I think once I found that out, I realized that through my entire upbringing, why I was so obsessed with food, because I couldn't understand you know, my, my mom being a vegetarian, you know, she would make very specific things. And it wasn't, it wasn't like that standard nuclear family affair where it was every Monday you have meatloaf and every Tuesday you have this and that. We, we were vegetarians. We didn't really eat processed food. And it was like the treat on the weekends. We'd go to our grandparents' place and we would have chicken or we would have, or we would have beef or we would have fish. And so it, it changed very dramatically from an early age when you're in your formative years, like how food would play a role in your life. So for us, it wasn't just eating for flavor, it was eating for survival, even if we didn't understand it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so because my, uh, my mom loved so many different flavors, it's, it's part of the reason why I've been eating jala a jalapeno and habanero and scotch bonnet peppers since I was nine, because it was the way she was adding flavor to otherwise very bland grocery vegetables. And both my brothers are like that too. And, and I still get made fun of when, when we travel even to these days, uh, to uh, anywhere today, that I always have to add chilies or spicy something to my food because it's like part of something I grew up with. So do you, ca like, you know, do you carry like around a little thing of pepper to put stuff in pepper sauce? I know I have friends you know, who do that. Yeah, it's that it's such a it's like a Jeffrey Steingarten thing, you know, from yeah. the man who ate everything. It's he used to travel with his own like personal size yeah. uh, Florida cell to season the food in the way that he wanted at top restaurants in the world. Um, we tried that. We actually tried that with uh, um, my husband, who's who's also a chef. Uh, we tried that by having these little like keychain size sriracha, like cock brand sriracha that we would have, but in the wrong situation, they do explode. And the oh, last no thing you want is sriracha covering like your keys and covering everything else. And um, we had like these small bottles, like in glove compartments of our car. So we'd go to like get takeout and then we'd like be dressing it in the car on a road trip or something. So we have done that. <laughs> but that was, all, that was also my introduction to ethnic food. Um, you said that your mother was from Europe. Yeah. So she, she, yes. She where did she? she Oh, she, yeah. oh, she was English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So she's from Manchester. And my my family uh, dates back to uh, the 1400s in the United Kingdom, um, Wales and England specifically. And my father's family are, well, he's third generation Canadian, but by way of uh, Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Poland, like Eastern Europe. Um, and so uh, food and survival mode food is is part of both families. <laughs> <laughs> Did she ever make anything English? No. Uh, well, actually, I, I shouldn't say that. If I were to ask her today, what are your favorite foods? She would say cedar plank salmon and something else. And then I'd say, but for real, what are your two favorite foods? She would say mashed potatoes and Yorkshire pudding. So I feel like deep down <laughs> inside, right. even the vegetarian, you know, British, British mother is still has those fan favorites that remind her of her British heritage. I love it. Yorkshire pudding, of course. Oh, <laughs> Yorkshire pudding, right? Now, did yeah. you do anything with the love of your food as you were growing up? Yeah. 
uh, when I was uh, when I was seven or eight, I started uh, actively participating in cooking and within our family. And so on the weekends, when I would visit our British grandparents that lived very close by to us, because they were they were part of uh, instrumental in helping raise us when we were kids, because uh, my mom was at work. Um, I was enamored when you talk about British food and British culture. I was enamored by the Christmas pudding, by the bread and butter pudding, the trifle, the roast, the gray roast, um, like any of the side dishes. And why on earth my nan would sit at the head of the table when all said and done, she'd sit down, everyone would be eating. And I say, are you going to have anything? She's like, no, no, I'm good. Because I mean, that isn't like the matriarch of the British family. It's like, they spend so much time preparing and making this like giant big deal, the Sunday roast to the holidays. And then they sit and they get more pleasure. It's more filling for them to watch people enjoy what they've done rather than eat it themselves. So I, love, I love it. Did you ever make any, any of that? Yeah. Or did you try your hand at it and, and help her? Well, yes. Uh, she was instrumental in teaching me how to make the perfect powdered birds custard. Now, <laughs> later on, I would realize in, in my culinary journey that creme anglaise was very different than powdered birds, whatever. <laughs> Maybe um, I had to start somewhere. Yeah, exactly. But I was, I was fascinated by, uh, by certain things. And uh, uh, I never made them myself because I felt like the, the, the idea of this like decadent food in the British household having it once a week, once every two weeks, once every time, like you'd have a holiday or a Sunday, that to me was enough. Like I didn't need to participate in that more. In fact, it helped me to become more excited about going back to our vegetarian <laughs> life. And then going to my dad's side of the family who were like the kosher life, you know, they're like, we're having matzo ball soup tonight. We're having, uh, we're having toasted flax bread with cheese and with, you know, this, this chicken. Matzo. I know exactly, and so we had like this this really weird like clash of the culinary families that were so different. But hey, you wouldn't have the palate you do today if it weren't for that. So oh, no, you were introduced not. to yeah. so many different kinds of foods quite young. Yeah, and uh, and because we didn't eat processed food, so you know any fast food joint, you name it, was off the table. We were never allowed to eat any of it, and it that would be the sneaky thing in high school. I'd be like oh, I'm going to go and have like a McDonald's hamburger for lunch, you know, just to say that I had one. And then I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go home and have a salad. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think uh, my my love of those individual flavors and for my brothers and I the same and just the way our parents um, had sort of taken turns and the way that we uh, that we consume food for, for health ended up pushing us immediately into ethnic food. So that, yeah. that became, and when you grew up in Toronto as well, I mean, it's, I mean, you've got, Little India, little Sri Lanka, little Italy, you know, little Portugal. We have so many diverse and incredible neighborhoods. And so we live very, very close to little India. And so curry, and as you know, Indian food is like the hallmark of vegetarian cuisine. And so we started eating more of those flavors. And then it sort of drastically changed our palates when we were kids. So now my mom was cooking Indian food. And then we were going out for sushi. And then we were eating like we were dining throughout the world based on a spice palette. And I think for most people, if they're not really sure what spices can really offer for us, we had this accidental crash course in food and flavor when we were growing up specifically built on our spice cabinet. I don't know how many eight-year-olds knew what to do with fenugreek or knew the, like any of that, you know? No, I had sushi for the first time when I was 21. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And it wasn't yeah. that much before you. So I totally understand. Now, when did you think, okay, this is a very huge question, but um, that f food and or being behind the bar and the restaurant atmosphere was really going to be the path that you were going to take? You know, I remember exactly the moment in my, you know, some of us don't remember specific like pivotal moments in life, but I remember this moment. I remember I was sitting on the patio of a restaurant at the corner of Queen and John in Toronto. And I must have been 19. I think I was on, like, I was sitting with my brother and another friend, 
and we were just chatting about the world. And I think at the time I was working at a restaurant in, in the neighborhood called Cafe Crepe. I was like spinning crepes in the window and I was like the general manager. It was so crazy. It was in my year uh, in between. Actually, I took like three years between high school and university. So I was just working people, food, whatever. And uh, I sat there and I said, I need to figure out how to blend food and a real job together. This is why I said a real job, food and a real job together. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go to culinary school. That makes sense. And so I think I got like halfway through the process applying to a local college, George Brown in Toronto. And then I, I, I was looking at the, I, I was looking at the schedule of classes and I had just missed the deadline because of course we can't oh. time our epiphanies properly to a class schedule. So I'd missed the semester. So I would have to wait another year to apply. And I thought, oh gosh, it's got to be something that I can do between now and then. And so I ended up, um, excuse me, I ended up uh, opening like a little catering company called Mademoiselle Chef. And it was the way that I could keep doing what I was doing. I was, I was still studying, I was still reading, I was still trying to figure out my path in life, what I was doing, but I knew food was going to play a part in it in some in some way, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurial, strong women. So I thought, okay, I'm going to like open a business and see how it goes. I was 18. <laughs> I was 18. And I started just cooking for people in the neighborhood. So I remember distinctly, I did like a housewarming party for my friend and his mom said, oh, why don't we hire Lauren? So I came over and I was making my like rice paper wraps and, you know, cooking and whatever else. And it didn't even matter to me if people were going to pay me or not. I mean, they did because that's the right thing to do. But I just was cooking for fun. Like I just I just wanted to do that. And so semester season rolled around again and I was looking at the uh, at the applications and I thought my older brother is a computer programmer maybe that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Is that the art form that runs in our family? Should I be like, should I be doing this other form of writing, which is like C++ and, and Java and whatever? And so I said to my mom, like, what do I do? Do I want to be a cook? And she said, well, I mean, being a cook now might be that you're trapped behind closed doors and you don't really get the face-to-face -face interaction with people, but you're really good on computers. So maybe it's worth checking out. Oh Crazy boy, enough. that's like yeah. as far as you could go from, oh, I want to work <laughs> in well, food and a job. You know what? <laughs> Computer I, programming. I, I love know. It. And, and, you know, I've, I, I have been saying to my, uh, to my family for years that, um, that, uh, when I was growing up, I spent more time and more money and I had no money. So this was like student loans. I spent more time, I spent more time and money, uh, you know, figuring out what I didn't want to do, then figuring out what I wanted to do, because I didn't want to be in a pickle later in life, in my 30s, having worked so hard for like a number of different things, thinking in retrospect, oh, you know what, I should have done that. I should have tried that. Should, is that like a skill set I should have explored? So that was partly why I did the computer programming thing. And to be honest, I dropped out halfway through the semester. I'm like, I hate this so much. And I'm very good on computers, but I can't like, I just can't wrap my head around just sitting at the keyboard, which is ironic because that's what we're all doing right now, but sitting at the keyboard and just typing out, you know, in some way there's like an art form to it, but I don't have the, the cerebral switch for that art form, but my older brother does. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I left and it was in 2011 my, uh, it was like right after like nine 11, like in October, November, 2001, 2001, 2001, 2001, I left, uh, halfway through the semester. I thought all of the things that are going on right now, life is way too short to be focused on things that I can't stand. And so I decided to, um, to leave and I chatted with my mom again and I said, you know what, I really need to figure out this this food thing, how I do that together. And she said, you know what, if you need to blend like some sort of international approach with taking care of people with food and flavor, like you just, you just need to find what path that is. And my mom's always been like that with myself and my two brothers that, you know, anything that we wanted to do, she never said, mm, I think you should do this instead. It was more, you're very passionate about this. And I see that. So how can I help you achieve what you want? So I, I ended up, uh, opening. Um, so I continued on with Mademoiselle Chef. And then I decided to get a job at not just, 
you know, some standard restaurant and bar that I could explore and like be a hostess or whatever. But instead, I would get a job at a bar and restaurant where I could actually learn something where it actually freaked me out to apply because it was so grand. It was just the the culture, the language, the wine knowledge, the food knowledge would just twist things into a different way of, of me thinking about it. So I wouldn't have to go to school necessarily. I could just have on the job training that helped to nurture that side of me that I really wanted to open. Um, so I never did go to culinary school in the end. Instead, I was studying, you know, one of, one of the first books that I picked up that changed my life, that changed everything was On Food and Cooking, The Science and Lore of the Kitchen by Harold McGee. And I eventually let, uh, I eventually met him in 2012. And it was like the craziest <laughs> fangirl moment where I didn't like fawn and go crazy. I was like, Harold, I have questions for you. You know, it was, uh, so it was, so it was very cool. And I felt uh, that reading that book and, you know, doing my cooking on the side, which eventually led to me just cooking in general, it became my home life. I didn't need to have like the catering company to do that. Surrounding myself now, no more high school friends. Now I'm surrounding myself with wine people, with chefs, with distillers, with winemakers, and with people that were connected to the original forms of culinary creation, Europeans, you know, I was all of a sudden working at Le Select Bistro and I had to fight for that job because I wasn't, I didn't take French immersion in school. I spoke a very small amount of conversational French and the owners of Le Select were, were like, we don't know. We don't know if we should take a chance on you. You're really like hyper and energetic. Like there's something about you that we really love, but I feel like we're taking a chance on you because you don't really have the requisite training for this job. Like you've never served. You've, you've only bartended like a few days here and there and like random jobs. Like we don't know. And I said, take a chance. You must take a chance. Were you so, going to be a server? Is that what your, the no, role was, was going to be? I to work behind the bar because I, I was still <gasps> nervous about the serving thing because I felt if I was going to work in food and beverage industry and really take it seriously that it needed to be in a creative role. So even though I wasn't necessarily designing drinks on a bar program, they didn't even have bar programs back then. This was like 2002. Um, you know, it, it would have to be uh, that I was focused on how do I, you know, how do I even pour wine? How do we open wine properly? How do we speak about wine properly? That was the art form. And so behind the bar and eventually you know, as the assistant bar manager over, you know, at Le Select after a couple of years of working there, I had learned this thick wine book and it automatically shot me into what I think would be my future. That was the pivotal moment for me. I had, um, I worked on a team of people that we couldn't have been more of a motley crew. I mean, people from all backgrounds, from all education levels and some no education. They were just, you know, people from everywhere from Mexico to the US to Europe to like different parts of Canada. But we all found a home together because we were all interested in French cuisine, French wine, <laughs> and a French cultural service style that was transplant planting European culture into Toronto. And I stayed for uh, probably about four years uh, at Le Select. And it was where I uh, first decided I was going to take my sommelier training, um, where I started to really understand, um, you know, one of the first spirits I ever learned anything about was Chartreuse. And that was really important for me because everyone kept ordering it. And I kept looking at it. And I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so it, everyone's got like their, their sort of pivotal moment for that. And I was in school at the same time. I decided to, to go to university. I applied as a mature student, wrote this entrance essay when I was 21 and said, you know, I really want to, to learn more about international culture, about international law, about, you know, peace and conflict studies. I want to know everything about basic human survival and human behavior. And because that was sort of what I was doing in the restaurant as well. I mean, we're taking, you know, I guess the pleasurable part of human survival and matching it with like the, the really legal and important part of human survival. And I thought by blending those together, I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I thought at some point it would, it would create 
you know, a, a very new concept or a way that I could continue in this industry. That I was really that forward. Question. Was you that- did. That was really <laughs> forward thinking of you at such a young age to mix those two together because I saw that you had studied, you know, political science, international studies. And I was wondering how those two came together. And so it's marvelous to hear you talk about it that way. But as you're talking about this, to me, you're sliding away, further away from food. Okay, if we think of food as just something you put, you know, meat and potatoes, as opposed to something you drink. Now, did you always think of them as one thing? Or Um, did you love the whole wine, bar, alcohol, spirits thing more? I enjoyed how they came together because my, you know, in my family, we were not, we were not big drinkers. You know, my, my mom used to, used to play billiards. She was like a pool shark. She was like the Paul Newman. I love your mom. I really want to. (laughs) Listen, my mother is like, not a lot of people can say that their mother's their spirit animal and like make it not about being like blood relatives, but she's for sure my spirit animal. She's just like the the coolest, the original cool, the original moat. Um, But, uh, she, to be honest, we always had tequila in the house. And so I always, from a young age, have seen her drink wine or drink tequila. So I think spirits and wine were always around. Um, but you just don't know, like, what that, like, how that actually impacts you. If you, if you grow up in a house, maybe that, um, that's uh, completely zero proof and non-alcoholic, I, I don't know, I feel like your understanding of of alcohol changes uh, at a different time in, in your life. And it's, it's very strange that you're the first person I've actually talked to about this. Like, it's just really interesting to see how some of those moments from when you were really young and experiencing, uh, I guess, being in the environment, you know, for the first time, I've got some friends that used to be bartending for their parents, like the, you know, mad men kids, you know, <laughs> like they'd be making bloody Marys and whatever. We never did that. It was more, I wanted to participate. I'm like, mom, I see that your drink is getting low. Am I, should I help you in some way? Do I go get you something? You know, I just, I, I've always seen, I've just always seen it around. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think it was the table though, because I'd never actually seen people have a drink without food. So the two were in, intrinsically connected for me, whether that was wine and food, and we saw that in the British household as well, or it was, you know, cocktails and food, like there was always antipasti, the barbecue was always on, there were always people over, like always people over. Um, and so it was, uh, it was a really cool household to, to grow up in, actually. And so I think Le Select, um, when, you know, fast forwarding to, to the, the French restaurant that I worked in, I think because we never had people sitting at the bar that only had drinks because it was a restaurant that happened to have a bar you could sit at a a zinc beautiful bar with a tin ceiling you know the same as you would find in any you know authentic bistro in Paris or anywhere else in France it it was like a very natural I felt like it was a very natural thing that the two would go together I don't know that I ever saw things separately and so actually as as I continued out through my career I never worked in a liquor primary and a liquor primary, meaning that all they served was alcohol and and beverage and had no influence of food. It's also uh, has been important to me to keep a lot of my closest friends as chefs, because if I wasn't going to be a professional chef, I needed to continue to add that professional culinary aspect into my life in some way. So um, most of my friends have been involved in food and beverage, and it's not because we work together. A lot of it is because, you know, they specialize in in things that are within the wheelhouse of what I wanted to learn. And uh, I, I, I just knew that, you know, being being behind closed doors and not be able to communicate with people face to face when you hand someone a dish and you watch that first bite, you know, from the window in the kitchen, uh-huh. you know, I, I don't know that that's something that I could I could live with. I think it needed to be more about the team and the gratification rather than just the team. Um, And uh, bartending was that outlet for me. And I think when you decide that the discipline you want to focus on is hospitality and the branch within hospitality that you'd like to focus in is drinks, then from there, it can branch off in many directions. We've got, you know, non-alcoholic, we've got wine, we have beer, we have sake, we have spirits. 
And then we have the branches from there, which focus into food and right, flavor and how these things are brought to life. Um, and so uh, every bar that I've worked in since, I have been uh, I have been in a managerial role that championed the expertise of understanding every aspect aspect of liquid rather than how I make cocktails, you know? So when I run a bar, the bar might have a specific concept, but part of, I guess, the condition of me coming on board and why I choose bar X over bar Y to work in is because of the food program and because of the respectable food program and the way that I could, um, that we could build programming that champions the back and front of house together. And that servers were not just you know, robots that were, you know, delivering plates and debit machines, but rather they played a critical role in the romance necessary at the table, Mm -hmm. the bartender, the romance necessary at the bar, the chef coming out of the kitchen and saying hi to tables, touching tables, as it's called the romance with, with the, the manager and the sommelier, the owner, like everything had to be like a cohesive system because there, there, it was never about me. It was always about being proud of the team that we would that we would work on together, which is again back to my background as a as a performer and as an athlete, and you know everything I've done has always has always been very much team oriented. So studying to be a sommelier was just a, a piece of that process, right? Not that your life goal then was to be a sommelier and continue with that, right? I guess you know yeah. everything that you've studied and done led you to kind of continue and, and, and rise in those roles, even though you weren't sure what they were going to be yet. Yeah. And I'm sure you can see my library, you know, <laughs> yes. but, uh, I, I've got a lot of books and a lot of first edition books. And Jonathan uh, is, you know, an avid collector of books that are in the same realm as well. And I think part of, part of what's very important to understand in, in this industry, in our hospitality industry, and especially as a, as a professional that aspires to something greater, certain things require certification and certain things don't, (laughs) you know, if, if you really want to want to understand the fundamentals of wine and different grape varietals and vinification and, you know, and, and just how vines grow, just understanding like from start to finish what happens and how it affects the final product having respect for people who work in the wine industry, I think it's important to get that certification Mm -hmm. myself. Um, I also think it's important to have some sort of certification with spirits, but again, it's not necessary. I mean, you can, you can learn everything that you need to know from books and from online resources, from other people, peer to peer mentorship. But I think the, the professionals in our industry that really, become the cut above and, and really become the leaders of our industry and innovators in our industry aren't necessarily the people that have certificates that say, congratulations, you successfully right. completed W set level three. I think uh, they're the ones that take the information that they have a high retention weight, uh, um, high retention rate for the information. And they have the ability to recommunicate that information to train other people. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's very important that if you're going to focus on this industry, that is trying to find all of the branches necessary that make you a better professional, that make you more of the expert in your field um, and to be the leader in the field, because that will open up far more opportunities, um, not necessarily just for work, but it also opens up more opportunities that people will find you and celebrate you know, your story and celebrate like how you're coming of age in the industry and, and sort of paying it forward to, to inspire other people that feel like maybe they need that certification to, to be honored in the industry. I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very important that, uh, you know, to understand that every professional in this industry is also very different. My focus on food and flavor and obsession with food science and international relations and wine and food and whatever is, is my personal story. And I would be a fraud if I focused on any other branch. It Mm -hmm. is uh, my story, what makes me a unique individual in this industry. And everyone has their own story to tell based on where they come from. Absolutely. And that's why I love interviewing people because everyone's (laughs) got their different stories. But it's, 
just harking back to what you said right before, I interviewed someone who was going for, uh, you know, oh, Diageo World Class, one of those. And he said he was talking to someone who had won the Diageo, the international Diageo World Class. And when he was going to 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 um, compete, this winner who was guiding him said, it's not what you it's not about the prize that you win. It's about what are you going to do after when you get that prize? Okay, so it's yes, you can be excited that you're getting it, but it's more important to think about how you're going to help everyone or what you're going to do with that when you get it. He didn't win it, but if that's that's the way of thinking, and that's what I'm hearing you say when you talk about it. Is is you know that's the important bit is what am what how you know if you get the certificates or whatever it is, it's. Not what are you going to do with that, but how are you going to help those people around you and make it a better industry by having one, having gotten those certificates and things like that. Yeah, you there, know? you know, there, and you're exactly right because there, there was a moment at World Class Global Finals where I realized that I wasn't going to win or that I was out of the top six, and I know exactly the moment it happened is when my <laughs> shaker broke uh, in the, the middle of our of the oh, no. round, and I was. Uh, I was 10 seconds over putting my last two drinks up and it was because I, you know, I was in the zone and I had planned it. I knew exactly what was happening. And I just felt that there was a little bit of egg that came out of the shaker in my new tins and it came apart. And so it, it's almost like getting splashed in the face to come back to reality. It splashed me on the side of the face and I've seen the video since then and it looks like nothing happened, but I felt it and I thought, oh my God. And then I just lost my train of thought just for a second. And the judges are screaming at me. They're like, get it in the glass, get it in the glass. And it, it caused like a, a 10 cent, uh, 10 cent, 10 second overtime. And it was right then and there. I'm like, well, that was fun. Cause I think I, I was on track to probably be in the top six and you know, who knows what would have happened after that. But you know, my, myself and another friend, Tess Potsumis, who lives here in Amsterdam and she owns a, a couple of bars and her and I became very fast, uh, you know, sister friends when we met in South Africa in 2015. We we're both competing, me for Canada and, and uh, Tess for the Netherlands. And I remember after they announced the top six, both of us went outside because we were both being followed by film crews. They picked 12 people to follow with a film crew. And so I was being followed and Tess was being followed. Um, and they followed us outside with the cameras. And there's footage of it somewhere. I don't know if it ever made it onto YouTube or not. God, I hope not. But it might be interesting <laughs> for people to see. But we, we literally just hugged for about 30 seconds and we're so upset. And then I, I whispered in her ear and I said, yeah, but our journey of having to compete is now done. There are 300 people inside that room that know how hard we worked. And now it's our job. Forget the other ones. They're like competing in the top six. They're like, we'll see them at the, at the finals gala, you know? But now it's time for us to go in and you know, create those relationships that are really going to build what our career becomes from here. Because otherwise the odds are just, the odds are too difficult to digest. If it really was that you had to win world-class to win world-class, then you wouldn't see some of the most incredible professionals in the in global industry today that did so much without winning. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you don't have to win world-class to win world-class. You just have to show up, do your best and remember that you're on camera and remember that that footage goes somewhere and that every interaction you have with someone could be the first day of the rest of your lives, you know, and that that was the most important thing for Tess and I. And that was five years ago. And today she owns two bars. She's got a thriving, you know, RTD cocktail to go business. We still work with her on world class. And she placed what number eight. And I placed number 12. And I'm the, you know, global, uh, you know, world-class ambassador and represent all the brands as a global, uh, D global cocktailian for Diageo Reserve and write the educational program. And we do so much. And I think we just, if you sit around and wait, and this isn't about anybody in particular, but just as a grand food for thought, if you win something and you expect that it's going to be like what you see or what you read in the texts and the, you know, pictures of ancient Egypt, you know, that people will just come and start fanning you and feeding you grapes and whatever. Okay. That might happen for the first 48 hours, the thrill of winning, like you're now like you're the person. But after that, if you don't do anything with the win, 
then, I mean, you're only, you're really only like, like the global flavor, you know, for a year, because then we start the search again and the system starts again to find the next bartender of the year. And I can see that all of our global winners have really embraced that understanding. Um, all of our national winners from different countries around the world have all embraced that, um, that you don't have to win world class to win world class. They've gone on to do incredible things. And I imagine that you could probably list off a host of bartenders that you know around the world. And I, I'd be willing to bet that at least half of them have competed in world class and didn't win the global final. Oh, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we talked a little bit about... We're going to end there. Yes, right before Lauren's Diageo world class experience and the launch of Bittered Sling, her award-winning bitters company. Tune in next week to hear it all. For now, you'll have to be content, very content, with her incredible Cocktail of the Week. Our Cocktail of the Week is the Fermented Pineapple Southside. The Southside is usually a ginny, minty, limey mix. But not surprisingly, Lauren has raised it to a whole other level by adding in Fermented Pineapple Cordial. You'll need to add the following to a shaker. 60 ml of Tanqueray No. 10 Gin, 2 dashes of Bittered Sling Grapefruit and Hops Bitters, 6 mint leaves, and 30 ml of her fermented pineapple cordial. Add ice to the shaker, then shake, 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 and double strain neat into a coupe glass. Garnish it with a grapefruit cheek with a threaded mint sprig. To make her fermented pineapple cordial, you'll have to go to a lushlifemanual.com where you'll find this recipe, more recipes, and all the cocktails of the week, as well as links to all the ingredients. If this cocktail doesn't want to make you go out to ferment something, I don't know what will. I've never fermented anything. I've pickled stuff like cucumbers and carrots, but that's pretty easy. But there's something about this cocktail that really has me excited to ferment something. If you live for Lush Life, make sure you're giving back to the bars you love by donating or taking part in cocktail delivery where you live. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly and wash your hands and stay safe. So next week, we're back with Lauren as she wins the Diageo World Class Canada Final and as she chooses the flavors of her bittered sling bitters. Until that time, bottoms up. <laughs>